the uh, join the button. I had the calendar invite, but not the Zoom. So, so that's that's the excuse I give myself when our numbers aren't good enough, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't find it. Couldn't find it. <laughs> Obviously, all the people want to see it. They just, you know. Right. Couldn't find it. So uh, well, I'm excited to have you, Jillian. I guess we'll just get started. We'll jump right in it. We're all busy people. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, if you haven't met Jillian before, Jillian is president of Premier Plus Realty here in Naples. Um, Jillian, give us the elevator pitch on Premier Plus and uh, all the things that you guys are. Uh, well, thank you. It, it is such an honor. I watch this show every week. I know that our founder, David Gallus, and Don Ross and Mike Hughes have had a long-standing relationship over the years in the market. And actually, Christian, I went to high school with your brother, so I think we're all... Yeah, we're I've, all I've continued here. to apologize for that. Dad, did you know that <laughs> right. Tom and Jillian yeah. went to high school together? I was thinking yeah. it was fun. I was worried for a minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lately, high school debate team. That's that's what it was. you were on the debate team. Did you go to the yeah. Harvard thing? I didn't. No, but we would always beat the Jesuits, which I was, you know, we, I was, they I were was the a judge in uh, Cambridge. I went up with Rick Curler, so I gave him the whole. I don't care how fast you speak. If I don't understand it, you're not getting points. <laughs> oh, maybe, yeah, I don't remember, but yeah, it was that was a great time. So. So I work for Premier Plus Realty. I serve as the president here. And we we like to say that we try to provide the most fulfilling careers in real estate. And we try to provide a pathway for agents for whatever their business uh, needs may be. Um, and we offer 100% commission, low fees, high broker support. And we recently affiliated with a national company called United Real Estate so that we can offer even more tool services and support while maintaining our ownership, maintaining our name, maintaining our brand, um, and so and maintaining our fee structure and all of that. So we were able to enhance what we offer. And uh, we just love Florida. We love where we work, where we live. And it's an, it, we just feel, in the words of our founder, better. We're, we're, we're doing better than we deserve. And just... Uh, oh, I love that. Be. That's cool. Dave, uh, Dad, you've known Dave Gallus for a long time. What, do you have any fun stories about Dave? Anything that's uh, viewer appropriate? <laughs> <laughs> he he uh, gave me a lot of advice about you uh, quite that's a bit. Good. He used to live down the street from us. I don't know if you knew that, Christian. And we, your mother and I would see him when we were walking uh, the dog. Uh, but Dave, uh, um, God, he's, he's, he's just, you know, I, I needed advice on how to work, do a business deal with my own son. And uh, I went to Dave. Yeah, pretty cool. Here's Broker Dave, up. right? Broker Dave. Oh, you're just a how many, band, how many so agents yeah. are you up to generally right now? Uh generally we're we're we hover around fifteen hundred. We have agents that have been retiring into our referral company. We uh the agents come and go depending on what's happening in their lives, but we're seeing some agents just choose to go into referral status with all of these business practice changes. So, but we, we stay between 1480 and 1520. So some, yeah. somewhere so around there. It's, it's a huge brokerage here in Naples, yeah. uh, pretty special company. The funny thing, the reason why, one of the reasons why you're on here, Jillian, is that ten, occasionally I step on your toes because of this video, it's possible. Um, and I would say that what that needs to be disclosed, that needs to be discussed. And that was one of the reasons I was excited to have you on here is that there's not just my opinion or dad, your opinion. There's the brokers ultimately are the ones driving this train and maintaining sure. compliance with the settlement. Jillian, can you talk to me about what it's like being in that position and you know, especially things that the agents need to hear that you guys are going through and kind of how, because it, even it's not just the two attorneys that are on this video, but you're having to deal with every attorney's opinion throughout town. Yes. And, and as a, a, an attorney's, no offense, but an attorney's favorite <laughs> uh, answer is it depends. So yeah. you might ask a black at what you think is a black and white question. And the attorney usually responds with it depends. And so Depending on the time of day, you get certain attorneys, you may get different answers. Uh, and so uh, we, 
I, I will say this, um, as a broker, we hold a lot of responsibility for compliance on, on several levels. Obviously, we have our federal statutes, we have our state statutes, and then we have licensure law, we have um, local ordinances, We and then on top of that, we belong to a trade association. And so we have trade association rules, our code of ethics. So we have layers of things that we need to consider in our business practices. Mm -hmm. And then the, the next layer on top of that is brokerage policy. How are we going to distill all of these requirements that we have to follow and make our business practices work for us so that our agents are profitable, we are profitable, and we can all continue to serve our customers well. So I would say that the layered approach to compliance, what, what's difficult about attorney opinions on NAR settlement or certain certain business practices is that a broker might have to operate in a different way than the next broker. For example, Premier Plus Realty, we we were sitting outside of the NAR settlement, so we had to settle on our own. And, and with for that the came, uninitiated, right? that Premier Plus was big enough that you had mm -hmm. to negotiate a settlement separately so you you didn't right. fall under the settlement you had to negotiate one separately yes and on top of that we had three class action cases served against us so we we really felt like to stop the bleeding we needed to settle and in order to settle we had to make some compromises and we had we have to implement some business practice changes that are that go a bit farther than what the NAR settlement requires the trade association to follow so, so there's just another layer of compliance. That's why I always say, I'm not an attorney. So check with an attorney, but also check with your broker to make sure that whatever the attorney's advice is, is consistent with what the broker is legally obligated to do. Yeah. So it's always good, you know, we refer to you, you refer to us, and it's a good partnership. That's why I appreciate that we have such a good relationship because I can say, hey, you said something that is, we're not allowed to do or we yeah we, yeah so yeah. The, to peel <laughs> so. back the curtain Jillian called me on something I don't know if you remember what it was about but it was I think it was gosh maybe you do remember because I'm drawing a blank I don't, I don't I it could have been um let's say it was definitely something about compensation and it was it was something to do with maybe a listing agent and the, and what the what forms mm -hmm. needed to be provided and you know how it needs to be disclosed. And this is maybe the topic we should get into, Jillian. Yeah. And you know we'll, we'll do this disclosure. Every person, every agent on here needs to refer to what their broker is requiring. Um, in our in our views, these are solely what we think how it should be applied or could be applied. And Jillian's how you're running your company. But here's the situation. This is the one that I think most people are really going to have to deal with. You're the listing agent. You have a valid listing agreement. And then you bring the buyer. Jillian, just with that very broad uh, hypothetical, what would you want your agent doing? And what's the bare minimum for an agent to do? And I know it also oh. depends on what forms you're using, too. Mm -hmm. Right, of course. The the flow of money and the conversation about compensation always starts with the seller. So we, we wouldn't have a, a buyer or a buyer's agent if we didn't have something to buy. So the conversation has to start with the seller. Seller, uh, here are your compensation options. Would you like to proactively offer compensation to a buyer's agent in order to satisfy what may be a written agreement between a buyer and a buyer agent? Um, or would you like to not proactively offer compensation to a buyer agent um, and see what, what offers come in? So, so the conversation starts with the seller and according to your brokerage policy and what you're allowed to do, that's super important to know. Um, and Jillian, the, the next, just um, so yeah. that we can show people, I'll, I'll put up oh, our sure. form here. So this is the listing agreement. So that conversation with your seller starts with a listing agreement. And, you know, there are different listing right. agreements you could use. Um, being that we're in Naples, we'll, we'll highlight the NABOR one. Mm -hmm. But what Jillian is saying is you got to have that conversation with your seller and you got to point out specifically this section, K, broker compensation. 
you know, what are you willing to offer compensation to the listing agent? And do you want us to offer compensation to a buyer's agent if there is one? That mm -hmm. That's the discussion you're saying we need to have first. And that makes sense. That's where it all starts. Right. And and I, I will say that this is an opinion, but um, all, all roads are leading to the 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 way of of sharing a listing broker sharing compensation with the buyer agent at the seller's uh, discretion or at the seller's authority or or um, uh, direction may, may not be the way that we are allowed to do business in the near future. Uh, we, You're we being don't know very that yet. careful with your words, Jillian. Say, yeah. just well, say, let's say it. Yeah. I'll say it for you. Well, when you, I'm on a litigation hold, so you're you're not. Yeah. So go. I'll go for say it. it for you. <laughs> there are concerns with yeah. a listing agent paying a buyer's agent. Right. There are just right. concerns that they're worried that you know that could open up future litigation. There could be uh -huh. issues with the DOJ. There could be things of that nature. So where. You know, where we have some level of prediction, what we're thinking is that it's at some point it might be the best practice to have a seller pay a buyer's agent directly. And that's not the right. way we do it currently. But, you know, historically, that's not how we've done it. We've always the seller pays the listing agent. The listing agent agrees to share some of that with a buyer's agent. So they're they're thinking maybe, you know, and not not just your company. Uh, this is this isn't your opinion, but we've heard other national companies think, all right sellers are going to pay the buyer's agent directly. There isn't going to be any sharing necessarily. And if you look at the statement of interest that the Department of Justice filed in one of the class action cases called the No Select case, you'll find that it's the, the Department of Justice's intention to fully decouple commissions, meaning they they really don't want sellers to have anything to do with what buyer agents receive they would rather have the seller offer a concession or a credit to the buyer and the buyer can choose to pay their buyer agent. That's not to say sellers won't still offer credits in an amount that will satisfy a buyer agreement, but I, I do think that is the intention. I think that uh, God bless America and thank God that we have due process so that I don't think they can file an injunction to to stop all of that immediately. Um, but but we could be compelled to go further in our new business practice changes to do that. So what does that mean? That would mean that a seller, instead of giving the the total compensation, as it's worded in the neighbor listing agreement, giving the total compensation to the listing broker and the listing broker now holds all the cards and says, okay, buyer agent, I will give you this amount. Um, the sellers allowed me to give you this amount. So when we receive a funding request, it's okay, we're receiving listing compensation and then we are allowing to share with the buyer agent. That, that They don't want our office to have anything to do with the buyer broker office. Yeah, so, exactly. In yeah. fact, Jillian, uh, one of the forms that we've kind of really started to like more and more is the FAR listing agreement. Um, and specifically, and Nabor has this as well, but in FAR, mm -hmm. it has the compensation to buyer's broker, and, and it specifies it there. You can authorize it there, or you can do, maybe, I'm, maybe I put the, pushed the wrong form here, mm -hmm. but you can offer a concession to the buyer, and then the buyer pays their agent directly in that way. Is that what you were thinking? Right. So so 10A is is the the traditional way that we've we've that's the shared yeah that's the traditional way. I'm sorry. Yeah. 10 10B is the seller paying the agent directly. So in the closing statement it would come from seller to buyer agent. 10C is where the seller says I will not proactively offer compensation. Um, obviously can be worked out on the sales contract. But if you scroll up, the first, the the, the only area that uh, deals with concession, Florida Realtors calls it a seller's expense. So I think it might be section five, um, a seller's expense. And they, they've made that a dollar amount. Couldn't... Maybe I went too far. Look at that. Maybe we're we're doing far. it on the fly so, here. Yeah, so there's a, there, any, anyway, uh, Nabor calls it seller concession. 
Florida Realtors calls it seller expense, and it's just a flat dollar amount. So if your seller wanted to, to, to go that route. So Florida Realtors has given an additional option. NABOR is really just traditional way of listing brokers sharing with buyer broker or seller concession. And uh, what I think is important in thinking about the, the holistic transaction is we start the conversation with the seller. How, how do you want to pay me as your listing agent? And do you want to pay a buyer agent? Uh, do you want to incentivize the buyer? We, we are not talking about incentivizing buyer agents. We, the seller should not care about incentivizing a buyer agent. The, the, the seller should care about helping the buyer with that closing cost that they may have. Do they want to proactively help the buyer or do they want to retroactively help the buyer? And it, if so, whatever is in that listing agreement, the, the other agreements need to, to coincide with that. So we have our, our listing agreement between the listing broker and the seller. Okay. And then on the other side, you've got your, your buyer agreement with the buyer agent and your buyer. Yep. We have the sales contract, which we have new writers or addendums for that. So we've got the buyer and the seller in the sales contract, and we talk about compensation in those addendums. And then we have a compensation agreement. So there are there are four agreements that deal with compensation that really ought to match the terms so, so that you know, the seller, the buyer know how much, who is paying whom, and uh, when, you know, all of that. Yeah, it's but, but totally it really, disclosed, it's not one, it all matches, right. yeah. Right, it's not, I think we're, we're seeing, we're getting a lot of questions like, well, if I have a compensation agreement, do I need it in the sales contract? And I was like, well, you have nothing to do with the sales contract, my friend. Mm -hmm. So, so you need to memorialize your offer, of, the offer of compensation in a compensation agreement. And so we, we really need to understand how they all work together. It's a four-sided deal. And as a brokerage, our compliance team is like, what? So we're just trying to match all of the documents together to make sure that they, they yeah, and from, from a broker's perspective, this part is so so challenging and so different, you know, historically, mm -hmm. and, and you can speak to this, Jillian, but you would, let's say there was a closing that happened. It's It's got to be half the time the broker didn't have all the documentation by the time the closing actually happened. You know, the agent kind of just, maybe they were late or slow in getting you documentation. So you would- That, that never happens. I don't never, know Never, no, yeah, no, never, 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 never. <laughs> but it's it possible that in some company somewhere, you you get a check from a closing and you don't even know what it is, right? You don't know what contract this was. You don't have a listing agreement. You, you don't have a buyer broker agreement. And you're like, oh, okay, well, let's just, let's hold on to it. And when, this, when the agent gets us everything, then we can pay out. And even that's being questioned. You you really can't just hold it because you you can't accept commission or compensation mm -hmm. until you know that you had a buyer broker agreement, until you know you had everything, all your I's dotted and T's crossed. Right. We are uh, that is always a challenge for every for every broker. We we have to legally keep paperwork for a certain period of time. We have to make sure all our, our I's are dotted and T's are crossed. And let me tell you, we are still dealing with the frenzy of 2021 and 2022, where uh, I, I just, we just submitted, um, we were, we received about 10 subpoenas in the last six weeks for oh. transactions that closed in that frenzy where there was a no inspection period yeah. and it was a, a hasty all transaction or an insurance yeah. deal. Yeah. So we've had to submit all of our documents and comply with that. Uh, so it is important that we, we maintain our agents, maintain their due diligence. We have our due diligence. We have all our records. That being said, how we're dealing with this is we received the check and we have to say, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, a, how did, how did the title company even get authorization to close this transaction without our, our commission disbursement authorization? So we're asking that title companies not just deal with the agent, but wait to get something from the office. 
especially if we're representing the buyer agent. And then we don't want to deposit the money into our bank account if the commission that the buyer agent is claiming is more than what is on the, the buyer broker agreement we have on file. Guess what we have to do? We have to send that back to title and then the title company has to get all parties to agree of where that overage goes. So um, it's, and, and we are going to charge a fine for that after, after the, a grace period because that's us chasing down commission. That's us having to make a bunch of phone calls and figure things out because our agent wasn't diligent with their paperwork. So that's um, it's that's a real big challenge. That that is, yeah. I mean, that is it's hard enough doing this job. But if you're also being debt collector on some of the stuff, it's really challenging. Uh, yeah. It's we want to be cheerleaders and motivators, right? We don't want to be punitive and wrist slappers. So it's just uh, it's icky all around. Well, it's why so. we pay all compensation in Bitcoin so that we can avoid. <laughs> that. Um, so all right, so you're a listing agent. Um, Jillian mentioned the four, you know, the four different corners of ensuring that your compensation mm -hmm. is accurate and disclosed. So you've got your listing agreement and your buyer broker agreement. Jillian, on if, if you're the listing agent, do you also need a buyer broker agreement? You're the listing agent? If you're the listing agent, you procure the buyer. Oh, no, Article 3 2. Yeah. So we we do not, you do not need a you do not need a buyer broker agreement with the buyer as a listing agent. If yeah. you're the listing agent, right. No, if, you're unless if, unless you're a transaction broker and you're representing the buyer. Yeah. Uh, in the so if you're going to make that next step and actually represent right. the buyer, it, and, you know, and dad, can you talk to me a little bit what our opinion has been on that? It, when does it cross the line to representing a buyer? What would you think on that one? I, I look at the agency requirements as a good guideline when you start getting confidential information, when it's uh, more than, hi, how are you? Uh, this is the you know, square footage. Uh, this is the asking price. Anything beyond that that gets into confidential, I think, is a good starting point. I mean, yeah. there's no real guidance, honestly, in the settlement agreement on what working with means. Uh, so, you know, the only guidance I've seen is in you know, 475, I think 278. Which are the Florida statutes. Yeah, I, I just right. just start there. And, and the big thing that we've been wrestling with is if, if you are on both sides like that, you have a the listing agents getting this 6% directly from the owner uh, and the buyer walks in, does the listing agent have to ch charge the buyer the same amount? Does he have to split the six into three and three or can he, can he just do zero? Um, you know, is, you know, how does that couple with the settlement agreement? Because there's this language in the settlement agreement about, you know, having both sides. Jillian, um, do you have a thought on that? Because I know, I think you and I have talked about it and it kind of depends on the listing agreement. Don't you agree? It, again, the conversation starts with the seller. So you tell the seller, hey, would you, would you like to proactively offer compensation to, to the buyer agent? And if, if another agent from another mm. company or another agent at my company brings a buyer, what mm. would you like to proactively compensate them? Um, okay, what if I bring the buyer? Would what would you like to compensate me if I bring the buyer? Maybe part of your marketing plan is to is to charge less than you would if you were just representing one side. Variable rate compensation. So if on you have to always honor what's on the listing agreement. So if your listing agreement. And I, I'm sorry, I can't talk numbers, but if if what's on the listing agreement is less, uh, if you represent both sides, that language has to be super, super clear because the broker holds the listing. So effectively, Premier Plus Realty could hold the listing and Premier Plus Realty could also bring the buyer. But we have several agents in our company. So rather than having an in-house commission dispute, let's specify which agent you're talking about. So it's not if listing broker brings the buyer well we've got several agents at our company it's helpful to be specific mm -hmm. listing broker and associate john smith brings the buyer would be helpful um, in a contract so that just to be very specific um, and then uh, outline what the compensation is in the other terms um, and and call call christian call your call your favorite real estate attorney to, to draft that variable rate language and if so, 
what's helpful is you could you could uh, slice it one of two ways. You could have, if you're rep, repping both sides, have total compensation come to just the listing broker and right. zero go to the buyer agent, which is you wearing that buyer agent hat and your buyer broker agreement says zero compensation. Or you could split the baby and half goes to the listing broker, half goes to the buyer agent. Uh, and then your 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 buyer broker agreement says that amount. So it's it's cleaner to do it the first way. Doesn't really matter. Uh, but what if what if buyer seller defaults? There's a default in contract, and now you have an exclusive buyer broker agreement with that buyer. That buyer turns around and wants to purchase something else. At least you're owed some commission for that effort. Yeah. So and it's if the buyer if the buyer defaults on a sales contract, you actually have some remedies against that buyer in that scenario. So right. that's a, a definite silver lining. So Don and Mark, they give us our first question. How do you explain that I can write this offer up and get paid from the seller, but I'm not transaction broker? How do you not help them get through the transaction? So I agree, Mark, this this is where the, the tough part comes in. Yeah. To me, you can show them the property, the settlement, the FAQs all state that showing them as a listing agent is not a problem. So you, if you yeah. have an open house or someone wants to make an appointment, have them come in and mm -hmm. almost, you know, as soon as it kind of crosses that first showing and the next day they call you, that night they call you and they want to talk, you probably need to bring that up, buyer broker agreement, I need this signed so that I can actually help you make these sort of, you know, kind of go through this transaction. And in the very least, I would have one signed up before you make an offer with that buyer. Um, and, you know, it's got to be fully disclosed how much you're making on the deal. And like you said, Jillian, you got to have the four corners all put in place so that you can ensure that not only do your customers know how you're getting paid, but then the broker can follow the logic. You know, how many deals, Jillian, I don't know if you're willing to say this, but how many deals do you have on average per day that that are closing? Mm. Well, this summer. <laughs> yeah, summer's been slow. <laughs> it yeah. was a slow summer, so we we ran between sixteen and twenty five a day. Uh, okay, in so the I summer. love that. Let's say it's twenty a so, day. Twenty a day, yeah. Yeah, so. your broker needs you to be buttoned up. You don't want to be the weird one. You don't want to be the one who's calling Jillian and saying. But I thought I, you know, you know, that's yeah. not ideal. You don't want to be in that position. You want to be like, I've gotten this buttoned up. We, I do it the same way every time. They And they've already approved mm -hmm. this process or this strategy. Dad, you and I have done this for our, um, our customers as well, where they, let's say there's a listing agent who gets a lot of buyers. You know, they, they're going to right. be doing both sides a lot. I think it makes a lot of sense to connect with your broker and get your plan approved. Hey, here's what I'm going to do. Here are the forms I'm going to use. Here's the special language regarding that variable commission or compensation agreement. Um, and, you know, let's make sure the broker signs off on it in advance because you're not going to do it just once. You're going to be well, back to it. what Jillian brought up earlier. You have, you have the listing agent. It's the open house. Uh, you're getting 6% under your listing agreement. <clears throat> Buyer walks in, uh, and I'm inferring from what you said, Jillian, it, it's okay to say, you, if we're going to go beyond me providing basic seller information about the house, uh, you need to sign this by a broker, and I'm going to put zero down. It's free to you, but you, you need to disclose the seller's charging 6%, and that's really how you're getting paid, because they have, they have a provision in, in the settlement agreement about yeah. you representing your services are for free. And what the lawyers right. are doing is distinguishing between services to the buyer versus services to the owner. Right, right. Well, nothing's um, free. So we do charge a transaction fee and the buyer is, uh, you know, maybe getting financing and the, it's ultimately the buyer paying for all of this and the seller is just allowing yeah, the, buyer's money. The, the proceeds of the sale. So we try to eliminate the F word um, from our, our language at all costs, but we I could say, say if you're going to use the F word, go for the gold, you know, right. We're right. From Boston, <laughs> we're, the, we're very comfortable. So we're, we're, yeah. So we're, we're, uh, we're saying, uh, I, I will be charging 0% compensation. We do have a transaction fee here and uh, among other disclosures, um, here, but the seller will be handling the compensation for me doing both sides. 
I'm yeah. getting paid enough by the seller so I can afford to do your side for zero. Right. Right, it's like right. nothing worse than the closing statement showing 6% from the seller and 2% from the buyer and the realtor is getting eight and then both sides and yeah. the realtor. So right. um, Mark right, and right. Don, they, uh, they clarify, they said, so in that agreement, I would certainly be wanting to limit my buyer broker agreement to just one property because if I put zero, I could be obligated to that buyer to work for free. Um, yes, absolutely. That, that would be the risk of putting zero is if you didn't tie it to just your listing, then yes, you could, you know, you, you'd have to amend it, which you can always do. You can amend it and that would be yeah. fine. Um, I like the, the property specific buyer broker agreements. I like the shorter ones. I also like mm -hmm. the idea of having something that's just a placeholder. In fact, that's mm -hmm. the word I kind of discovered this week when I was talking about the pre-touring agreement. It's a placeholder. Mm -hmm. It allows us to work together, go see a thousand properties this weekend. And when you find one you want to make an offer on, we'll sit down, we'll sign a buyer brokerage agreement, and that amount will likely match what the seller is offering. You just have that conversation. I love the word placeholder. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to use it over and over again. The other analogy is dating versus getting married. Well, right. uh, or or a Tinder date versus dating versus oh, getting wow. married. So, <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, it's like it's like okay, we we met up for, for no lunch clue. and then you never hear from them again. So <laughs> that's awesome. All right, Jillian, uh, my dad spoke with Caddy, uh, Patty Ketchum, who is on Florida Realtors. I think she's a yes. commissioner there. Um, and she owns a brokerage up in Tallahassee, and it might she might be in other states as well. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of caught on to some of her videos that she's done. We found her really engaging. And one of the things, and I thought you would be the perfect person to ask this question of, um, and, you know, this is what I do, Jillian. I just kind of surprise you with the topic. Yeah, uh, I do not talk about it. So Patty was talking about a plan where you actually specify or the buyer specifies that only show me properties where the seller or listing agent is offering concession or compensation uh, to help right there's like an only feel like, yeah i yeah. don't know mm -mm. so she <laughs> she doesn't she operates mainly with the far buyer agreements yeah um she's not familiar with the neighbor and so i figured let's give me let me show everybody how this looks on the buyer broker agreement she did yeah. say the outline approved this language initially and she has since changed it which she's going to text me the language probably tonight so this was something where you, um, it's the section nine, buyer yep. elects or declines to be shown properties where no seller concession is being offered in connection with the sale thereof. So I think she was using this and, you know, she's going to be modifying some of her videos and her advice, but um, she's using this to get over the hump with a buyer who mm -hmm. just can't get comfortable with the idea that they're going to have to pay you your compensation. You know, that you just, as many times as you explain it, they just don't get comfortable with it. And so Nabor actually has this language already. What mm -hmm. Patty was recommending is that if it, if you're using a buyer broker agreement that didn't have it, you could add it, but mm -hmm. then, and this is why you're the perfect person to ask these questions it is a possible fair housing, equal opportunity violation. It is a possible mm. NAR ethics violation. Steering. <laughs> yeah, all yeah. steering, commercial bribery. Yes. These wonderful he terms. Yes. Talk to me, Jillian. So he here's, what, here's me. a perfect example is just because it's legal and allowed doesn't mean it's a good risk mitigation measure for you as an agent. So... Uh, so Premier Plus Realty, one of the terms of our Premier Plus Realty settlement agreement with the lovely plaintiff's attorneys in Kansas City, Missouri, who I got to meet and give him a piece of my mind, um, which because this is recorded, he's a lovely person That's doing the awesome. right thing for America. <laughs> yes, um, <laughs> is that um, is is we half even if the buyer says or elects to not see a property that's not offering the compensation to satisfy their bba that we premier plus realty agents still have to present the properties to the buyer and they can reject them one by one so here's here's what this means if if you are and 
I hope this isn't offensive, but if you are a listing agent, or I'm sorry, if you're a buyer's agent, you have a, a buyer broker agreement for a certain amount, and you are searching the market, scouring the market, and you are withholding properties that are not offering compensation, here's what that means. Mm -hmm. You need to go get your negotiator's certification from NAR. You need to take a contract class. Uh, you need to work on your sales skills because if you're doing that, that means I'm too scared to negotiate with that seller. And now we have national brokerages who are prohibiting their listing agreements from allowing sellers to compensate buyer's agents. This is happening around here. So you don't know what the seller's net desire is to receive from a sale. You don't know what they want. So here's what you're going to do as a buyer's agent. You have your BBA, you try to get what the compensation is. Listing broker could be in Fiji and you have no idea. Are you gonna not show that property? So you are going to show all properties and you're going to keep a record of all properties that you present to your buyer so that you save your own behind for future litigation for steering. And you're going to say property A offering this amount, it's less or more property B, like Goldilocks, you know, th this one is, oh, I don't know, or property C, seller not proactively offering, property D, couldn't get a hold of the listing agent, property E, uh, they're offering way more, and you got to figure that out, so so you don't know, so you need to present them to your buyer, even if they elect, and then they can, they can go one by one, if there's a property that meets their articulated criteria, it's a 3-2 in North Naples, um, you need to present that to them, and then you need to go, you, you, there are many ways, that to, many roads to getting compensation. Um, that, that's a whole class. No, so it's perfect. You, yeah. You're able, you're able to negotiate that compensation in many different ways. And it's up to you to know the four quadrants of compensation uh, in regards to our agreements. And so nine times out of 10, I, I heard a statistic, and this might be helpful, is that is that by and large sellers typically nationwide end up conceding about 5% of their net proceeds. So for to the buyer, for buyer agent compensation and buyer credits. So this is what's and and we're in a we're in a buyer's market right now. So the seller is a little more willing to concede if mm. you ask for it. If you, ha you have not because you ask not. So ask for it in the sales contract. Mm -hmm. Ask for it in the compensation agreement. You never know what the seller is going to do. So the bottom line is present all properties, even if the buyer thinks they don't want to see it. Um, because that just means you're a weak agent that can't negotiate. Sorry. Oh, I love it. No, you didn't offend me. I'm okay with that. All right. All right. Yeah. So can I, um, can I ask a question of Jillian at this point? Oh, I might allow yeah. that. Yeah. You might allow that. Now, what happens if you do that? And I, and I like that approach. You give it to them anyways. You know, how are they uh, being damaged? They're not. Uh, what happens if the seller is still unwilling to pay your agent? Does your agent continue to work and work for free or do they withdraw? And if they mm -hmm. withdraw, do you have a withdrawal pro protocol so they don't get a fair housing complaint filed mm -hmm. against them? Well, uh, they can increase the... They can increase their offer price and then ask for it. Yep. Right. If, you know, if that jives with their lender. Right. Uh, they so th there are there are a couple of roads to that. They could ask if they're if the listing broker is allowed to share compensation. They could ask the listing broker to mm -hmm. share compensation. You know, as long as it they, they do it in accordance with the code of ethics. Right. Uh, they uh, if the seller just won't do it and the buyer really wants that house are you right. really going to stand in the way of that buyer getting that house no but does your, right. but does your oh. agent walk away from the deal do they terminate those their buyer broker agreement or do they work for free in this case what's what's safest i don't i don't think they work for free i think they if 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 we are in a no-win situation you have <clears> exhausted <throat> every effort then my recommendation has been to refer it to the listing agent for a 50 percent referral fee Oh, I so like you it. get something and let the listing agent take care yeah, of it. You get out of the way. You have a protocol, they... Jillian, where they come to the office and there's witnesses. So you don't have the fair housing thing to deal with. You know what? I, I don't know. That's a good, that's a good idea. So, yeah. 
So it, it's it, it's such a wild thing, and and it's neat that yeah. Patty, who kind of even suggested this was a thing, you know, the core of it, the reason why you would maybe check that box or add that language is you're just trying to get the buyer to sign the buyer broker agreement. You're trying to be right. in compliance. You're and and by being in compliance, by getting this buyer broker agreement, having to compromise or settle mm -hmm. a little bit, you've opened up this box of worms, this can of worms. So. I think the overall opinion would be whatever you need to do to get that buyer brokerage agreement signed. If you're checking that box or adding mm -hmm. that language, that's fine, but never steer your customer away mm -hmm. simply because compensation is be not being offered. That Absolutely. is not going to work. It's Joanna Watkins who raised in her latest Q&A in the Florida Realtors uh, YouTube channel, uh, the dangers of this fair housing situation and having a mm -hmm. protocol in place uh, and having them willing to swear up and down that you offered to show them everything under the sun. But I like your approach. Just send it to them anyways, document mm -hmm. it. Absolutely. You know what the good thing is? This sunsets in seven years, Dad. Seven years, and we don't have to do it anymore, right? What, what wise person told you that? Yeah, you might have <laughs> brought that up earlier. I was worried, Jillian, I was worried that this this settlement, NER settlement would haunt us forever. Uh, but then uh, my dad pointed out that it actually has a sunset provision where it, it terminates or the, the practice changes terminate. But yeah. I think what that would allow is that it allows the industry to adjust in a pretty monumental way. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then seven years from now or whenever that time period elapses, we will be so changed by it that we should be serving the customer better and we should be that more comfortable and we should be able to self-regulate without fear of this settlement over our over our heads. I'm so right. worried about the Department of Justice, so I don't think they're done with this. About... Or the Federal Trade Commission. Yeah, no. right. yeah. So to clarify, yeah. someone put in the notes, my broker said we cannot put zero in the BBA because it says the buyer will not get paid, the buyer broker will not get paid compensation greater than the BBA agreement amount. And that is absolutely correct. Uh, just to clarify, our scenario that we were discussing was if you're also the listing agent. And it also, if you're using, if you're going to put zero in your buyer broker agreement, you need to educate your buyer that you will be amending it later depending on you know what property they end up buying. Um, my, my question with that, Christian, though, and I, I discussed this with uh, one of the brokers, it, what if you have a, a buyer who's unhappy with the way the whole transaction was conducted and what repair requests were granted? Uh, will that buyer say, I'm not going to sign unless I get the new washer dryer? I'm not going to sign because I just don't love you anymore. You, I don't think you really had my best interests at heart. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not signing a damn piece of paper, period, end of story. Uh, now you've got a tortious interference situation where you have an independent contract with the owner. You know, the agents owed that money, and we're letting the buyer thwart his ability to get paid. Um, well, yeah, I mean, this is a, it's a strategy that could backfire. If you do zero and then tell them that you're going to be amending it later, they don't have to sign the amendment. They could totally right. take advantage of you. That is the risk. In fact, that's that why your listing time. agreement needs to have that variable rate language if you rep both sides. So there it, you go. Variable rate. All and the, that, all just the to, bananas go to the listing broker. Just so. to clarify what Jillian's referring to, she's she's saying that only in the event that the listing agent is representing both buyer and seller. Would you know this new rate be applicable? Um, it, okay. It's you know different than on you know what we saw, Jillian, in the settlement where you can't have a variable rate to a buyer. Um, definitely a right. different scenario that you're talking about. Right, doesn't apply to listing agreements. Right. So just just in the buyer agreement. So. And seemingly in the in the listing agreement, it would actually benefit a seller to you know it would be a it would be a positive change for them in that scenario. Right. It well, might yeah, be I, worth putting in the buyer broker agreement that the rate is zero, then in parentheses, uh, uh, disclose that the seller is paying the broker X percent, whatever it is. So there's no, there's transparency, which is the underlying goal of this whole thing, supposedly. Yeah, yeah, I think that's fine. Or or when you send over the agreement to be signed or their copy of it, you put it in the email saying, just so you know, I am getting paid as a listing agent, you know, as you're aware or something right. like that. Sure. Mm -hmm. You know, Jillian, I have a question. This is where we'll end it, I believe. Um, 
we talked about those four corners, the four quadrants, mm -hmm. the compensation agreement. I've actually gotten a little bit of pushback on this from some people. Um, mm -hmm. could, you know, if, if you're in your, um, you know, your accounting department and you're looking to make sure, did they check all four boxes, mm -hmm. but you know, they didn't have the compensation agreement. Is that a deal killer? No, it's not. So in order to, in order to authorize commission disbursement, we would, we would look at the sales contract and then we would look at the listing contract and we would look at the buyer broker agreement. Uh, the compensation agreement is simply an added layer of protection to memorialize the offer, either from the listing broker to the buyer broker or the seller to the buyer okay. broker. So really that's where I appreciate the new addenda to the neighbor sales contract and the Florida realtor sales contract uh, so that there's no question about where compensation comes from. But the thing to remember is that agents are not a party to the sales contract. So if the buyer agent is due compensation from the seller in any way or mm -hmm. the listing broker in any way, we, we used to have the MLS as our memorialization of the, the guarantee of the offer. We don't have that anymore. So now we just traded that for a piece of paper called a compensation agreement. Um, my recommendation, well, I don't know. Can I can I say what, at Premier Plus Realty, no we, other broker like has opinions. to do this. <laughs> I have an opinion uh, is that we, we make those compensation terms a, a very short amount of time because they're not effective unless they're, signed by all parties and delivered. So um, if if you have a compensation agreement that you've given out to a bunch of people and they're not effective because you, you haven't received it back, but now you, you receive an offer with one of those old compensation agreements, you just have to look at, 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 at that uh, because your seller mm -hmm. could have changed their offer of compensation. So right, this is where right. communication is dangerous. Uh, be clear. Yeah. Yeah. So the, in fact, FAR does a good thing here. They've got a couple of compensation agreements. This one is seller to buyer's broker. So there's probably a little bit less risk to the broker in this one because, um, you know, it like what Jillian, what you were talking about, <clears throat> listing agreement changes and you, you amend the listing agreement, mm -hmm. but you have one of these compensation agreements out there to a potential buyer. That could be mm -hmm. a risk. So you you limit the time frame on here. In fact, on this one, it has the term in section three. You'd put you know ten days, five days, one day, whatever it may may need. Mm -hmm. Separately, there is another form. The that would be listing broker. No, oh, that's not one. Sellers broker to buyers broker. This one. Let's see if I can download it quickly. So in this one, this is where the risk comes in, is you, you you sign 10 of these and any agent that asks for it, you hand them out like Tic Tacs. And so you right. hand it out like Tic Tacs and then you know you don't get an offer right away. You get an offer 30 days from now and the listing agreement may have changed. So now you've obligated right. your broker to paying the old commission rate, compensation rate, as opposed to the new one. So this is that is a problem. I haven't seen this that. This is the one they say, leave at open houses, leave a stack. Uh, That's the advice they're giving. I, I, it is a risk. I would I would say that what would have been helpful is if the addenda to the sales contracts had been released prior to the compensation agreements because the uh, the the addendum to the sales contract compensation provides for a compensation agreement to be executed in order for the contract to be valid so it would have been nice to release those prior to we us doing 100 yeah. hours of training um, but here we are. So, so you could very well go and, and, and execute these before a showing that would be helpful to you. But again, now that we have these nice addenda, now that we have a nice clean way for your buyer to be in the driver's seat of the compensation you receive, uh, I think that it, it's not totally necessary to have those compensation agreements authorized prior to a showing. Um, so you can work that out in the sales contract. The sales contract won't be valid until the comp agreement is signed. So your your buyer can can rest easy on yeah. that. Yeah, and you can rest easy as well. Right. You know, you I think you know in the short term people were thinking, oh, we'll just you know I'll call every listing agent. Maybe agents are still doing it, but they they want to call every listing agent before showing the property. 
-hmm. Well, that could be steering. You know, I think you got to show up, you, you set up the, the showing and then mm -hmm. you know, separately you ask what the what they're offering. But this is the, one of the forms that Jillian was referring to, which is the addendum to sales contract compensation. It's basically saying that it's a contingency to the seller agreeing or the listing agent agreeing to pay a certain compensation. This is a mm -hmm. this is a great form. You're, we can make our offer, even if the listing agent never told us or we never even asked, we'll make our offer contingent upon mm -hmm. being offered this amount in compensation. And then obviously if that's not included or not agreed to, then the buyer could come back with a different different terms. You know, they lower the price and pay their broker directly, which yeah. would be fine. Same, same difference. I mean, ultimately, the buyer's agent has to help evaluate what the property is worth. Right. So that's really got to be a part of your, your value add, that you are going to help the buyer determine at that price, should you expect to have to pay compensation to your broker or should it be included? You know, that mm -hmm. we'll have to we'll have to be able to add that in there. So Jillian, thank you. You were awesome, as always. Uh, Dad, any other uh, words of wisdom for us before we all leave? No, no, I'm, I'm, now I have to call Tom. Tell him that I said hi. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. If oh, you need uh, Jillian, reach out. She's at Premier Plus Realty. And if you need us, uh, we'd be happy to do any closings with you here in town. So good luck. Thank you, Jillian. Thank you. Yes, thank you.